Hi everyone. Um, first of all, I am so sorry that it has been so long since I last did a Dog Science Explained video. They are going to be out more regularly in the new year, I promise. So, social learning in dogs. First, I'm just going to take a minute to explain the meaning of a couple of words I'm going to be using. Um, and these definitions are also in the description. There are two types of social learning. Imitation, which is the exact copying of a behaviour one animal used to gain a reward by an observing animal. And emulation, where the observing animal doesn't copy exactly the same behaviour, but uses a slightly different method to achieve the same goal. Next, two behavioural processes that are often confused with social learning but aren't are social facilitation, this is where the animals perform a behaviour because those around them are. Think about sheep in a field. If one starts to run, they all run, even if they have no idea why the first sheep is running. Social facilitation doesn't require the learning of a new behaviour or an understanding of what the other animal's motivations are. Therefore, it doesn't count as social learning. The second one is affordance learning. This is learning about the environment through second-hand observation and is easy to confuse with social learning. For example, say a stray dog knocks over a bin while another dog is watching and then eats the food inside. The next day, the observing dog knocks over the bin to get the food inside. Now, it's easy to assume the observing dog learned how to get the food from watching the other dog. However, Imagine if the observing dog had instead seen the bin knocked over by the wind and eaten the food. They might still return and knock the bin over. It's possible in both situations the dog just learnt that the bin contained food and then went back to knock it over to get the food. So it's not actually learnt anything from the other dog. And unless studies test for this, we can't be sure if the dogs have learned socially or merely by observation. And finally, there's stimulus or local enhancement. This is where the attention of an animal is drawn to an object or location by the presence or behaviour of another animal, but the animal doesn't learn anything from observing. They are simply drawn to the area by the presence of another. Social facilitation, affordance learning and enhancement don't require complex mental processes, but true Im imitation and emulation suggest the animal is able to understand the link between the demonstrator's behaviour and a reward they would like for themselves, and then use this information to get that reward by copying the actions of the other animal. So this is what the studies we're going to look at were testing for. So we'll start with a study by Herberline and Turner. A demonstrator dog was shown food being hidden behind one of four screens. For half the trials, the food was then removed without the demo dog's knowledge, and in the other half, it was left there. An observer dog, 37, were tested in total, was then brought in having not seen the food being hidden, and the demonstrator dog was released. The demonstrator dog always went to the screen it had seen the food hidden behind and ate the food if it was there. The demonstrator and observer dog were then allowed to say hello, and the observer dog was let off lead. If the demonstrator dog had found and eaten food, the observer dog was more likely to sniff the demo dog snout, whereas very few had snout contact when there was no food found. Whether the dogs had snout contact then had a knock-on effect on their behaviour. So as you can see on this graph, in the food found trials, dogs which had snout contact were quicker to visit the location of the food than those who didn't. With this side of the graph here showing the number of seconds it took before the dog reached the place the food had been. This suggests the dogs which had snout contact realised their companion had found food, so it was worth going and checking the place they had been. Alternatively, in the food removed trials, snout contact increased the time it took the dog to look in the place the food had been. This suggests that in these trials, the dog used snout contact to tell them the demo dog had not found any food behind that screen, so it made sense to look elsewhere first. So this study would suggest dogs are able to look at the behaviour of others and then use cues that tell them if the dog was rewarded for that behaviour and therefore if it was worth copying. Next we'll look at a study by Pongras et al, who investigated if dogs could learn from a human demonstration. Food or a toy was placed behind a V-shaped fence and the dog had to detour around the fence, moving away from the reward in order to get it. All the dogs were given one attempt at reaching the reward and then half the dogs saw a person carry the reward from where they stood, round the fence and place it down. And then all the dogs were given two more attempts at reaching the reward. As this graph shows, the dogs who saw the human demo 
improved much more, uh, i.e. they got to the target much faster in their second attempt than the dogs who didn't see a demo, regardless of if the demonstration was their owner or a stranger. However, dogs didn't always follow the path of the demonstrator, i.e. some went left when the demonstrator went right and vice versa. So this rules out true imitation, but could indicate emulation. Again, check the description for definitions, and if I ever use a word and forget to explain what it means, please do ask me in the comments section. It has been suggested that the improvement of the dogs who saw the demo was caused by stimulus enhancement, i.e. they were drawn to the end of the fence because they saw the demonstrator there, and from there they figured out how to get the reward. However, if that was the case, again we would expect the dogs to have gone the same way as the demonstrator, which they didn't. Another interesting finding was that dogs who were unsuccessful in trial one remained unsuccessful, as in they never got the reward in any of the trials if they didn't see a demo, but those who did see a demo were subsequently able to solve the task. Now, Pongratz et al. conducted a further study using the same basic design to see if dogs would continue to use a behaviour they had learned from a demo even when there was an easier alternative. So the testing dogs were split into two groups. One group had doors open in the fence to give the dogs easy access to the reward in trial one. The doors were then closed for a subsequent three trials. In group two, dogs learnt to detour the fence with doors closed, having watched a human demo in trial one, and they then had three trials with the doors open. In group one, all the dogs used the door on the first trial and then were unable to solve the detour task when the doors were closed, but if they were subsequently shown a human demonstration, they did a lot better. In group two, the dogs continued to detour rather than use the doors, i.e. even though an easier option was available, they continued to use the methods they had copied from the human demonstrator. The next study um, by Mersman et al. had two parts. This first one we'll discuss here and the second part we'll come back to later. So Mersman used a similar method to Pongraz, only they used a straight fence and the dogs were split into three groups. Group 1 saw a demo, walked from the dog, around the fence to the reward, and then the demonstrator went away and hid. In Group 2, the demonstrator started from the reward and walked to the dog. For Group 3, a box was pulled past the end of the fence uh, with a, a rope which had bells on to make sure the dogs were paying attention, and this was to control for local enhancement. In Group 4, a person on the other side walked along the fence to the reward and then behind the screen to act as a control for just the effect of a, the presence of someone behind the fence. Dogs in conditions 1 to 3 were more successful than those in condition 4, but there was no difference between dogs in 1 to 3, i.e. the presence of a human demonstrator did not help the dogs any more than a box to call their attention to the end of the fence. As an animate demo wasn't needed, it was not social learning, and these results suggest that the other detour studies was simply a case of the dog's attention being drawn to the end of the fence, and then them figuring out by themselves how to get round. So if we move on to some studies that looked at solving puzzles, we'll start with Miller, Reeves and Zentel, who tested if a dog would copy the direction of a screen push to get a food reward demonstrated by a person or dog. And there were two experimental conditions. Dogs saw another dog push the screen in one direction to get a reward, or they saw a person push the screen in one direction to get a reward, and then there were the three control conditions. Dogs saw the screen move independently to control for affordance learning, then two groups saw the screen move independently, but either with a dog or human in the room. Having seen one of these five demonstrations, observer dogs were given six chances to push the screen. Dogs copied the direction of the screen push when they were shown a dog demonstration, but not when the screen was moved mechanically. However, dogs also copied the direction of the screen push when a human demonstrated, but the same occurred if the screen moved mechanically and a human was just present in the room. These results suggest dogs are able to use observations to learn that the moving of a screen makes food appear and to copy a demonstrator's behaviour by imitating the direction the screen was pushed, but that this learning is not necessarily dependent on the screen being moved by a human or dog. 
Next is what is probably the most interesting study so far, Range et al. This looked at a more complex form of social learning, selective imitation, being able to understand that some aspects of a behaviour are not needed to achieve an end goal and performing the easier option, emulating, only when there seems to be a contextual reason the demonstrator is not using this easier option. If there is no contextual reason for the more difficult choice to be used, the animal reasons it is necessary to gain the reward and imitates exactly. So dogs were tested to see if they would selectively imitate the action of a demonstrator, a paw or a mouth pull, on a wooden bar which caused a box containing food to open. So the tester dogs were split into three groups. The control group saw no demo and this was to measure which method the dogs found easiest and the majority of the dogs used their mouth. Secondly, the mouth occupied group saw the dog demo pull the lever with its paw while holding a ball in its mouth, giving a reason that it wasn't using its mouth. And finally, the mouth free condition, the demo dog used his paw while his mouth was empty, meaning there was no reason he should use his paw unless it was necessary to gain the food reward. Each dog saw 10 demonstrations and was allowed to eat the food the demo dog had released. So if we look at the results, you can see a higher percentage of dogs in the control group chose to use their mouths, and a higher percentage of dogs in the mouth occupied group used their mouths, suggesting the dogs were able to reason the dog holding the ball was only using his paw because his mouth was busy, therefore there was no reason to think the preferred and easier mouth pull option wouldn't work. Whereas, those in the mouth empty group tended to use their paws more, suggesting when the dog's mouth was empty and there was no reason to use his paw, the dogs imitated the paw use as they reasoned it must be necessary to get the reward. Otherwise, why would the dog be using it? And this study has provided the first evidence we have for selective imitation in the dog. But... Kaminsky et al. in 2001 criticised Range et al. study for not controlling for the presence of the ball, which Kaminsky argued could have caused a predisposition towards oral behaviours in the dogs, explaining why more of them use their mouths. To check this, Kaminsky et al. repeated Range et al.'s study, but with an added condition, in which the demo dog used her paw with her mouth free, but there was a ball tied to the rod. Dogs in the mouth occupied and mouth empty but ball present conditions both used their mouth more than in the no demo and mouth empty conditions. This suggests the selective imitation Range et al. seemed to have found was caused by the presence of the ball, not an understanding of context and selective imitation on the part of the dog. Range et al. then conducted a further study using a puzzle box, and although dogs opened the box quicker when they saw a human or dog demonstration, and interestingly there was no difference between these two, they were equally effective, the important finding was that the dogs who saw the demonstrations did not go straight to the box and use the demonstrated method to open it. Instead, they went to the box and then, after a period of trial and error, learned how to open it. And this result is more in line with a case of stimulus enhancement than social learning. And if we now return to the second part of Mersman's study, which was designed to retest Ranger Tal's findings of selective imitation, we find a similar thing. Dogs saw a demonstrator dog pull a towel from under a basket to get a reward. Half the dogs saw it pulled out with the mouth and half with the paw. And they also had a control group where the dog simply ate the treat off the uncovered portion of the towel to control for stimulus enhancement. Overall, only 40% of the observer dogs were able to get the treat out and there was no difference between the groups, i.e. dogs who saw a demonstration did no better than dogs who saw a dog eat a treat placed in front of the bot. There was also no effect on the demonstrated action on whether the observing dogs used their mouth and paw. So again, no evidence of social learning was found. And finally, we'll look at Tenny et al, who tested to see if dogs could learn a command by observation, in this case down, which they saw another dog getting rewarded for. So half of the observer dogs had been trained to lie down, but to a different command, and the other half had never been trained to lie down. And there was also a control group of dogs which had been trained to lie down but saw no demonstration. And this group acted as a control by giving a baseline, i.e. how often would the trained dogs have lay down just because they saw the food without the effect of a demonstration. Having watched the demonstration, the observing dogs were taken to the human they had just seen rewarding the demo dog for lying down. They were given a period of time to see if they spontaneously lay down, and then they were given the novel command word. In the untrained group, 
no dogs lay down. And in the trained group, the behavior was performed no more than in the control. So basically what this study found was the dog's behavior was not affected by seeing another dog earn a reward for a behavior. So in this context, they were unable to learn socially. However, you have to remember that this is a very artificial task. The behavior required was not obviously goal-directed, like it would be if the demo dog had found food or had to release it from a puzzle. And the behavior required was not one naturally used in food acquisition, like pouring or mouthing. So, a bit of a mixed bag in terms of evidence, with some studies suggesting dogs are capable of very complex forms of social learning, and others finding that observing another gaining a reward in various contexts had no effect on observer dog behavior. Furthermore, subsequent study in many cases has revealed that there is a simple explanation for results previously thought to indicate social learning. So, rather than giving a conclusion myself, which I have been doing previously, I'd like you guys to say whether, based on the evidence discussed here, you would conclude dogs can learn socially or can't learn socially. Okay, so thanks for watching. Our next video is going to look at evidence for theory of mind in dogs, and that's probably going to be out sometime at the end of January, beginning of February.